Guten Morgen und willkommen. Good morning and welcome. My name is Ivan Weivoda. I am with the Institute für die Wissenschaften von Menschen. And today's debate, as you know, will be uh, in English. Thank you to all the sports lovers who are going to miss out on the Hanenkam and the Australian Open uh, this morning. But uh, it's always wonderful to see the exceptional turnout. Uh, a wonderful Viennese habit on a Sunday morning in winter to come in the warmth of the Bourg Theatre. Uh, as you know, we are four organizers of the Debating Europe series, the venerable institution that is the Bourg Theatre, the Erste Stiftung, the uh, Der Standard newspaper, and my institute. Uh, this has been going on for many years. And we have tried to raise uh, to the expectation to answer some of the difficult questions that this beginning of the 21st century is posing to us. Today, as you see, we will be discussing the dangers of democracy. And uh, in American jargon, it is showtime now. And I would like to invite Eric Frey from Der Standard to come to the stage with his guests, whom he will introduce. Please have an enjoyable morning. Thank you very much. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here with us this morning uh, to our discussion about uh, with the title, Who is Afraid of Digital Democracy? Uh, we have a small but powerful panel, which I would like to introduce. On my left is Franco Berardi, he's an Italian Marxist, theorist, and activist, the author of 2,000 books. Uh, his main focus has been on the role of the media and information technology. Uh, uh, Franco is also a member of the advisory panel of Democracy in Europe Movement 2025. Um, Ingrid Brodnik is an Austrian journalist and blogger. Uh, she's a regular columnist for Profil. She's an expert for technology, digital policy, policy and also ethical issues. Her latest book is called, was called Übermacht im Netz, warum wir für ein gerechtes Internet kämpfen müssen. And John Frank, he's an American in Europe, uh, vice president for EU government affairs for Microsoft and leading the Microsoft Brussels office. Uh, has been involved in um, European and US regulatory and legal policy, also has a blog on technology policy. Um, Microsoft is probably known to all of you. It's the third largest corporation in the world by market capitalization, the second among the IT giants after Apple. But the interesting thing is it's usually not included in the list of the so-called FANG companies Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, which are seen as the dominating, uh, the, 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 dominate, the dominating the technology world. So it's kind of the, the somewhat hidden giant in our in in this in, in, in this world of technology and policy which we are facing today, and which we're discussing today. Um, the digital revolution was once seen as a great opportunity for the extension of democracy, for grassroots uh, participation, transparency, uh, communication which can no longer be controlled by governments and which will allow people to participate and create sphere of freedom. Uh, and I think there were some instances in the past when this actually came true. I mean, the Arab Spring would not have been possible with, without social media uh, communications and also recent mass protests in some places against authoritarian regimes. The digital means were, uh, were extremely important. However, this utopia has more and more turned to a dystopia. And uh, people, and the title, Who is Afraid of Digital Democracy, would probably should be, uh, should be uh, phrased today, Who is Not Afraid of Digital Democracy? Uh, the manipulation of public opinion through fake news, incitement and hate speech on the web, the total surveillance in China, uh, which is kind of creating the, 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 the real, making Big Brothers, uh, always 1984, uh, visions uh, almost a reality, 
the alleged or real loss of control by legitimate democratic governments over vast part of technology, the risk of hacking, disrupting civil society, but also democratic processes. So we do have a lot of uh, uh, reason to be worried. Um, the most pessimistic outlook that I've seen recently was the interview Franco Berardi gave in the Standard, uh, published on Thursday, uh, where you, Franco, say basically whole, all hope for democracy is lost. Uh, and you, as I understand, you not only talk about the fake news and the surveillance issues, but you say basically there is an information overload which is killing democracy. Uh, can you explain that? Well, information overload is uh, killing democracy in a sense, but the, 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 the thing that is killing democracy first uh, is the impoverishment of, uh, of people everywhere, is precarization of labor, is inequality in the distribution of wealth, and so on. That, that is the, the real killer of democracy. Mm -hmm. Then comes uh, the anthropological and technological mutation that you can synthesize with the expression information overload. Uh, actually, uh, information overload means that our mind is going through a sort of uh, radical redefinition of the, of the relation with the infosphere. Uh, Marshall McLuhan has said everything in 1964. When the, the technological machine shifts from the sequential field of alphabetical communication to the simultaneous field of electronics, the human mind goes back or forward, who knows, from the critique to a comeback of mythology. We have entered a kingdom of non-critical uh, thought. That is the point. Is it bad? Is it good? Let, let's wait okay. and see. Okay. Uh, Ingrid, I mean, you are writing to an audience which thinks they are critical and able and educated. Uh, I mean, do you see also that, that how the technology is actually reducing the space for an, an, an informed, intelligent discourse that democracy needs? Um, I think that uh, we have a somewhat idealized idea about how people deal with information and how people dealt with information in the past. So I think that when we say people are um, kind of overpowered by all of this information, I think that we just did not see how people would have too little information in the past or perhaps were also overpowered, which I mean, let, let me explain mm -hmm. for a second. Um, sometimes when we talk about is this too much information, is this bad for democracy, um, there is uh, this idea that we are in the age of post-truth, post-facts. Mm -hmm. And I must say that this idea, I think, is wrong. I think there was never an age where facts were ruling. And so what you see now is that um, disinformation often spreads faster than information. But I think that um, we, we, that people, a lot of people in our society, for example, believe in things that are factually wrong. We had this before, but it's now more visible. So what I want to say is that you have, I think the one big difference that the, the, the internet brings is that you have um, things within our society which become more visible and developments which become quicker. But I don't think that technology in itself is the problem. As um, Franco Berardi said, I think um, it's often the question not is technology the problem, but what kind of technology do we have? And I would say we live in an information system where big tech companies have produced um, programs according to their business models. And their business models are not built around democratic ideas, they're built about, for example, selling ads. And I think there's a big difference how you would program a lot of platforms when you want to have a public, um, very, um, friendly or at least neutral discourse and how you build a platform when you just want to sell ads. And now we have these platforms, we're working with them every day and we are always astounded that when you have uh, these ad-centric internet platforms that they lead to very outrageous discussions. Just to explain mm -hmm. for a second, 
um, the thing is, when you want to have a lot of people on your platform, what really helps is emotion, because if they always read interesting or outrageous things, they tend to stay longer on your site. So there is the, the danger that today's platforms are built in a way that are rather, um, in German we would say, boulevard desk, tabloid style. So by which I mean you get a lot of amusing or enraging content and then you stay longer. And now we have these systems and a lot of us are not happy how they um, play into the, the public field, in the, to the public debate, but it's really hard to get back and build other platforms. So I think I would agree that we have a problem, but I don't think it's technology in itself, it's the type of technology we have today. John, is it, what, is your, what is your response? Well, I think especially social media uh, and technology in general, uh, I wouldn't assume that it's either positive or negative. I think that people create it and put it out in the world hoping it's going to be used for positive things. But I think that as creators of technology, you have to look at how your technology is actually being used, and you have to take responsibility for it. So things that we think are going to be very positive may turn out to have some very negative consequences. And so the creators of technology need to own up to that. But that's just one part of it. I mean, society, social values, should control. I mean, we as a society get to decide how we want to have the public discourse. And, and so we do have democratic means to, to regulate. Um, we do have democratic discussions to figure out how we build and adapt to the new world, because the, the world is changing. And the paradigms that we grew up with are not the paradigms that we live with today. And we do need to affirmatively engage and say, what kind of society do we want to live with? Franco, um, the governments in general, you, governments claim that they want an informed public and discussions and, uh, and, and, and don't want the kind of loss of, 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 of uh, fact-based debates uh, that you are that, that you that you are observing, uh, are they just not telling the truth? Are they are they actually supporting this uh, these kind of developments that you describe, or are they just helpless? Governments. What what, what are you talking about? Government. Uh. <laughs> I mean, the word government uh, is an old word that means nothing today. Actually, the word that we use properly is governance. Governance. And governance. Yes. And the philosophical, political shift from the word government to the word governance has very much to do with the end of politics, with the end of the political reason. What is politics? Machiavelli explains, Machiavelli, of course, is an authority in yes. the field. And uh, in the paragraph number 25 of The Prince, he says that. Uh, the prince, the government, is the male who is able to submit Fortuna, which is female, so she is capricious and unpredictable. Well, this yeah. uh, machist uh, identification of power has been working for 500 years, yeah. and the result is under our eyes, the destruction of nature, the destruction of human sensibility, and the affirmation, the assertion of the capitalist uh, uh, power. Now, the word government, the word politics, the word will, means less and less because the real decision is not taken by the political authority or by the majority of people going to the polls to vote. Look at Greece 2015. People voted there in the very country where the word democracy is being created now. Governance is the automation of the relation between language, technology, and social application of technology. So this is power today, governance, so, no so, governance. So is it the voting process, which government is elected or which parliament is elected that is the problem? Or is it the, because parliaments and governments <coughs> 
they pass laws, they have regulations, they have civil servants doing their job, or are they just ineffective? Where is the, where is the weak link in your, in, your, in, 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 your, in your scenario? In my scenario, parliaments uh, and governments uh, are poor people who can do less and less. I think that uh, I have nothing against the politicians except compassion. I understand that their problem is impotence. Impotence is the real okay. problem of the humankind nowadays. Okay. Uh, yeah. You see, yeah. it's especially a masculine problem, impotence, <laughs> in all the <laughs> sense of the word. I mean, it's this kind of uh, mm, losing an ability of governing things that uh, was effective in the modern uh, times. Mm -hmm. But capitalism has been uh, inscribing the, the, the rule, the economic, the social rule inside the language itself, inside the automated language of technology. Mm -hmm. So what can do politics? Mm -hmm. Yep. Can I just yes, add to it? Yes, um, I think, perhaps I'm not seeing it at that um, pessimistic, but I think that there is indeed the problem of um, perhaps not impotence, but new potence, by which I mean who, who decides for us, who decides for society. And I think that we have to ask the question if um, our democratic ideas are being ridiculed by the power structures of technology. And just one example to make it clear. Um, a lot of you probably remember in 2017, 2018, in the last years, we had a lot of problems in uh, Myanmar, in Burma, and um, we had um, genocide, we had attacks against the Rohingya, the Muslim minority there, and um, when this happened, when such an, um, a current wave of attacks on Rohingya took place, this, the following thing happened. Mark Zuckerberg told about it in an interview um, with an American publication. He said he was, he was called by an employee on a Saturday morning, and they told him, we are noticing that um, in Myanmar um, there are um, messages sent to... Um, to, which are saying that you should become violent towards mm -hmm. the other ethnic group. And they, they noticed that via the Facebook Messenger, that was the platform they used. And then he told the journalist who he told the story, they decided to net not let these messages through, so they blocked yeah. those mm -hmm. messages. And I think, I think he told this story to show that he's being responsible, yeah. that he does not think it's a good idea to allow genocide. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us would agree. But it's, to this point, it really makes me think, because this is one guy who gets a call on a Saturday morning, and he decides how to deal with genocide in a whole region. And this is not very democratic, so it was not, it was not a court, it was not a parliament, it was basically a company. And you have to know at Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg controls about 60% of the shares, so basically it's him who makes the decision. Nobody can fire him except he himself could fire him. So this is the one thing we see as a change in power structure. And the other thing, when, if I understand you correctly, um, you mentioned voting and the, basically the autonomy of citizens. And I think that when you look at how technologies are built, we need to talk about autonomy because a lot of these systems are built that you push the right button, the button that helps, for example, collect your data. And we all know these interfaces, which are cleverly designed in a way that you probably leave more data behind than you would if you would have read everything or you would have clicked on every single button there. And uh, you probably, some of you probably know this, there is this really interesting book by Shoshana Zuboff, um, The Age of surveillance capitalism in which she explains that what has changed is that technology is in a built in a way that wants to push you in a certain direction. So for example, your data is being used to be analyzed, to put in a category, to enhance the likeliness of you pushing a button or you buying a product. And there is even advertisement out there which will, um, where you will get, uh, which Facebook, for example, will only get money if they refer you to their sites or where they can say they calculate how highly 
how likely you are to push that button to go on the site. So I think this idea that data collection is being used to influence people, I think this is a very powerful idea because we have to talk about autonomy and whether our autonomy in a way is being limited by such systems. Mm -hmm. John, you're working in Brussels, which is often seen as kind of a place of overbearing power, particularly on, on the internet when you read messages, uh, working on regulations, I mean, is... Uh, are governments and intergovernmental institutions uh, impotent these days? <laughs> well, let me just begin by saying that I, I think in Mark Zuckerberg's case there, I think you want him acting ethically, <laughs> right? I think the, the, the challenge isn't when companies act ethically, it's when they don't act ethically and they don't set up, step up to their responsibilities. Um, and that is where regulation comes in. I mean, companies do have different incentives. Uh, and we do hope, certainly, companies take responsibility for how their technology is actually being used. And I think that that does lead to some very important decisions about how you're going to conduct yourself. Um, you know, so, for example, you know, we've decided we will not take political advertising. Um, and, and then we've advocated that if you are going to take political advertising on your platform, that you limit the targeting of it to some macro level, because um, you know, going back to your earlier point, we, we're, we seem to be going into these digital tribes where we, because of the way algorithms work and things, we tend to see things that just confirm our, our existing views. And so as we separate ourselves out, um, it becomes easier and easier to, to not hear the other side and, and not be exposed and not to engage because ultimately democratic processes require compromise and an understanding. But this is your government, this is, sorry, this is corporate policy, this is Microsoft, their Absolutely. own decision, like Zuckerberg said, we don't let this message right. through. And what and is the role then of, 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 of government and regulations? Well, um, nobody, you know, we, we think a lot about these issues, but we re also recognize we weren't elected by anybody, right? And it is the parliament um, that, that has the voice of the people, and, and there are opportunities for them to step up. Um, we've been calling for, for regulation around some aspects of artificial intelligence. Um, we think that there are responsibilities um, around platforms for misinformation. Um, there's a fine line in the information space because of general protections of freedom of expression that governments shouldn't be regulating that space. Um, and so we've been looking for things that we can all embrace as being positive for the social discussion. And so there's a, there's a group called NewsGuard, for example, that doesn't try to fact check stories, but when you do an internet search and you've, you've installed NewsGuard on your browser, um, it'll give you a little green check uh, if the news source is reliable. And they vetted the news sources. Uh, in the United States, there's about 6,000 news sources that provide about 98% of the news that's consumed. Uh, news guards available in Italy, France, Germany, UK currently. Um, and, and the idea is to, to try to, without fact checking, say their standards are reliable journalistic, professional journalism. We're not saying the story's true, but it's professional journalism. And you can click through and, and understand how they got that rating. That's a positive thing. But, but in the misinformation space, it goes to looking at what's our resilience from foreign interference, for example, because foreign governments we know will exploit the vulnerabilities in our society, uh, and I think that we need to take steps. And so uh, campaign finance laws that prohibit foreign governments from donating to political candidates or, or giving loans or, or injecting their money and influence into political processes, I think becomes very important. Um, also, we can look at, um, you know, I think we can, ab you know, television as a powerful medium that, that grew up uh, 50 years ago, um, we created regulations for it uh, and how it's affected in campaigns. Well, perhaps we should be looking at how do we regulate social media advertising uh, for the modern world because we do know it does have some very important problems. Um, now, 
marketeers in the commercial space love to be able to find the consumer who has a particular need for a product. And so one of the classic jokes is, I need to find the left-handed cat owners in Boston to sell my product to. Do we have, do we have any left-handed cat owners in the audience? Um, there's probably two well, of you. Um, okay, right here. Uh, you know, now that works fine if, if you want to sell a product, but if you're trying to sell a political message, I think it's dangerous to have an ephemeral, undisclosed message just to people like that. Because I, I'm not required, when I, when I take out an advertisement in the newspaper or on radio or, or television, everybody gets to see it. But if I can target a message just to a left-handed cat owner, um, and there's no dis disclosure, there's no accountability, it takes, um, it takes a real hit to the truth and to accountability in the system. So I think that advertising uh, and the targeting of advertising is particularly pernicious. Um, before we turn to the issue also of fake news manipulation, I would like to ask you, Franco, uh, the only person I know who is even more pessimistic than you is probably Yuval Harari, the Israeli historian. Uh, he, his <laughs> argument, you're basically saying it's the political economic system that is destroying democracy. Basically, he says it's technology itself the, for particular the merging of biotechnology and, and info, information technology, which is destroying the, uh, the, the, which is trying the, doing away with free will and, 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 and therefore human freedom. Do you see political changes? And basically he says this is almost unavoidable because that's the way the technology is going. However, you as a political thinker, do you see political changes that can stop this movement into, a, into, a, into an unfree world? Frankly speaking, no. Okay, then you are just no. as pessimistic as, no. as, as no. Harari. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I am pessimistic in a different okay. way. Yeah, I like Harari very yes. much, especially when he speaks of this subject. Uh, but the point is that the transformation we need it's not politically social and cultural. When I say social, I mean that you can have the best uh, uh, circulation of information, the best government uh, and the best will, but if people feel exploited and humiliated, they will try to use technology and communication against, against who knows, against everybody, you, you know. Do you think, um, just to be more, more precise, do you think that those people who vote uh, for Donald Trump, just to name the worst? <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you well, think, you have um, Salvini too, uh, who, is, yeah. <laughs> who is much better, I would say, okay. An interesting <laughs> game. <laughs> Do you think that those people who vote for Trump or for Salvini think that uh, Trump is innocent, is a good guy, is someone who is caring about? Absolutely not. They want revenge. This is the only thing they want. The majority of the American workers or of the Italian workers have been cheated for 40 years by neoliberal uh, government by the neoliberal left. It is the left, the neoliberal left from Blair to Macron. They are the, the heart of darkness of, of the present <laughs> catastrophe because they have opened the door to fascism. So it, now it's useless, it's, it's not so useful to perfect the machine. The problem is to change the brain. And the change of the human brain implies, first, a different social situation. People have to understand that humiliation can roll back. Second, they have, people have to feel that richness, wealth that they have produced is not only for 1% of, uh, of, uh, of society. First. Second, uh, the, the cultural transformation is important.
important, but it's not only yeah. technological. But I have to ask you now as a Marxist, I mean, the issue of false consciousness is not something which is new, and this has been something also Marxists have been dealing Absolutely. with for over 100 years. Uh, is it impossible to change the thinking and also then the voting behavior of these work, Italian workers who rather than vote for what is in their interest, or what you claim is in their interest, uh, uh, gives, gives the votes to, to right-wing populists? The concept of false consciousness has been important in the past, but now it's too ideological. It's, uh, it's referring to, to to a sort of fall of self-falsification of the, the ideological view. I think that uh, the political problem now has shifted from the, the level of conscious reason and false consciousness to the level of unconscious. You know, psychoanalysis has been long considered as a separated realm in, in the field of, uh, of society. No more. Mm -hmm. No more. We are dealing with a real massive psychopathology, not in the old good sense of Eric Fromm, uh, the problem of freedom. <laughs> no, in a much more radical, deep sense, people are massively suffering. I, I, I watched the, the last Ken Loach film. If you, uh, sorry, we missed you. Uh -huh. Beautiful, okay. beautiful and totally despaired. What is he saying? He's saying the precarization of life this has destroyed the ability of people of thinking on their yeah. own life. That is the mm -hmm. point. Would you like to respond? Yeah. Yes. I Andrea think it's. Um, I, I think this is a good question. For example, why are people voting for Donald Trump? It's. I think um, we have a lot of um, examples in Italy, also in other countries, where you just are astounded who gets votes. And but look at Trump because he's the worst case scenario. I would agree. Um, and we live in a time when something for a lot of people uh, that, that seems horrible for a lot of people is happening. You think, what is the reason behind it? And it, we live also in a time of digitalization. And so we have the tendency to always blame technology for societal problems, for political problems. For example, um, so I would agree that when, when, if you try to explain Trump, it's too easy to look just at Facebook, because then you would like suddenly not look at the whole society and the political, um, for example, um, the problem that, um, especially in the United States, if you look at wealth and the, distri the distribution of wealth, it has become so worse, so much worse in the last 30 years. It's it's much worse than in Europe. If you look just at the data, um, and the, in, during the election 2016, there were some really good articles that also explained what you just said. That when people, when you looked closely, why people voted for Trump, one of the explanation was that. Um, they had the feeling that the existing system with the, like the normal type of Republican and the normal type of Demo Democratic candidates, it didn't bring them enough. And when you see that the existing system doesn't bring you enough, you kind of get, um, you might be more inclined to use something totally crazy to see if that works. So it's like um, it's when you are already um, feeling left out, you might be more prone to vote for a re very radical candidate. And this could also help Trump. And now get back to technology. I would still say that even though technology is not the reason behind Trump, it was not a good factor. It was, in, I would say, a very, very bad factor in this e election in 2016 because um, Trump and his team could use technology in a very enraging way. And um, we saw that they use targeted ads in quite uncanny f fashion. And um, just one example where you see that we have, um, that we, have um, we, we need to talk about the influence. I don't think that, for example, fake news um, led to the victory of Donald Trump, but it could lead to a uh, growing polarization. Just to explain, there are now some really good studies on the spreading of disinformation in the 2016 election. For example, by Jason Rifler, Brandon Nehan, Andy Guest, three political science, uh, scientists. And they saw, they could measure that 27% um, of Americans did see fake news in the uh, really important weeks 
ahead of the election, 27%, so that is one in four. So in the United States, um, when the media got uh, read this study, they were like, oh, it's really good, it was only one in four Americans who saw fake news. And they were so relieved, and I think this is kind of absurd, when you're happy that it was just a fourth of your population that saw such awful things. And, but th this is right, so what this, this study and other studies showed is, um, the people who read fake news and read a lot of fake news in the election, they were often already going to vote for Trump. So it's not, at the, the, at the, at the current situation, as far as we, what we know, it's not that people saw two or three fake news stories and then said, oh, I was going to vote for Hillary Clinton, but now I'm going to vote for Trump. The more likely scenario was that they were already inclined to vote for Trump, and in this field of the, uh, in, in this part of the population, then they saw more and more fake news, and they got more and more enraged. So I would say that what fake news, for example, do, they, they, there is perhaps a gap within the society, and it increases the gap, it increases the friction and polarization. But I would not say that fake news or technology are the problem, the underlying problem. Fake news only work when there is already some polarization there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. John, is the fake news problem, is it as bad as it's often described, as it allow both domest by domestic players and also international. Well, can, can anyone steal an election these days if they, if they play it right? You know, I think uh, Abraham Lincoln, an American president, said you can fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Um, and, and there's an element of, you know, I guess politics and the art of persuading voters has always had these elements of, uh, let's just say, persuasive use of the truth. Uh, and I think we just need to recognize that. But um, going back to you know, the, the, the 2016 election in the United States, it, it was decided by 80,000 votes in, across three states. It was an incredibly close election. And, and so one of the other things that Abraham Lincoln said is, uh, the sorriest uh, politician uh, he ever met was the person who became mayor by one vote because everybody in town could say they elected him mayor, right? And so in these very close elections, you can point to lots of factors uh, that made the difference. But there was definitely, you know, I think our understanding of the political sphere in the United States is different today. Uh, it used to be there was, a, there was this hypothetical person in the middle who both sides were trying to say, come over to my side. But today it's more, no, we know, people know how they feel about the Democrat candidate, the Republican candidate. They're undecided about whether or not they'll vote. And what we saw was in the 2016 election, a significant drop off um, of African Americans who'd voted for Barack Obama did not turn out to vote for Hillary Clinton. And you ask yourselves, why was that? Well. We don't know. But we do know there was definitely misinformation flooding, trying to make them less enthusiastic about voting for her. Um, and, and so trying to discourage people from participating in the political process. Now, whether that was Russian uh, Internet Research Agency or other political operatives, I mean, you know, we can all speculate. But, but there is this effort of discouraging voters today, uh, which is brought about by misinformation and targeted uh, political advertising. But there is just part of what we live with today is people have a harder time figuring out the truth, their truth. There's, there's no one single truth, but your publication, their standard. I mean, you know, today, kids growing up, I don't think they have a standard. They're looking for, how do I make sense of this? Because when everybody has a voice, it does just become, you know, the, the noise overwhelms, and trying to figure out what that truth is becomes much more difficult. And can this be, how easily can this situation be exploited by active players, perhaps based in St. Petersburg, uh, trying to change the political outcome in other <clears throat> countries? All too easily. Uh, you know, if, if, you know, we talk about Russian interference, the model as we understand today is, is not to try to say black is white, 
but when the Scripple poisonings happened in the UK, and, and they used a nerve agent to, to target the former Russian agent and his daughter, um, they flooded the story with a hundred different theories of the case. And, and so you didn't have to like buy in, it was just like, oh, this is too complex, I can't process that and decide what's true. Uh, and so it, it's, it's the lots of different theories being put forward. It, so it's flooding the zone as opposed to trying to be the great deception. That that's what we really struggle with, which is why professional journalism and their standard become essential to helping people. But you know, we need to figure out how to how to re-engage the young audiences um, so that they can. You know, we're not saying there's one you know one newspaper in town, but but people need some intermediation of trust. Perhaps if I can add something, something to else? it. It's, I think this, um, this is also interesting uh, when you look how this Russian interference or Russian um, information strategy works, it shows you how propaganda has changed. In the past, when you would think about propaganda, it would have an ideology to it. So you would um, have propaganda arguing that the Soviet system is better than the Western capitalist system. It would be about ideas and about, um, it would be a, 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 a about the question which is a better type of society. But modern um, propaganda, it's much more cynical. In a way, it's not about which is the best society we can live in, it's about um, raising doubt. So when you look at such um, very problematic Russian activities, when, when you look at Russian me, um, media organizations or at trolls online who post uh, things that um, seem to help this Russian agenda, they, um, spread, um, they spread doubt, they um, spread um, uncertainty. If you look, for example, if you remember bombings in Syria, um, and if you remember, for example, Assad's, uh, the, the question whether Assad used um, chemical weapons against his own population, what Russian media outlets did, they did not say, this is the truth, but they put out a lot of different theories. And at the end, when you get, like, every day a new theory, what could have happened, you're very um, overwhelmed. And this is, I think, this really annoying thing about this is um, overwhelming people with different theories works really well and it's the really horrible thing is it, it doesn't it's not even around built around an ideology or a, about idea what what is a fair or just society it's just trying to undermine other states mm -hmm. and also the trust in our democracies and if I, one last sentence this is this is the ir irony about it um, what makes democratic systems different from of a, of a authoritarian system it's the that we allow a pluralism of voices, and that we allow plural, a pluralism of voices is being hijacked by Russian actors, by Russian um, players. And this is because this thing you could not do in Russia because they would not allow mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Would you like to respond to any of this? Or? Well, I, about this problem of fake news and so on, I remember the interview with a guy called the Paul Horner. Um, he's dead now. Nobody knows why, but... Uh, and Paul Horner was a professional liar, a professional faker. Um, and he said in this interview, I, I, I think in the Washington Post, anyway, he said, Oh, yes, uh, I, I am the author of the, the news about Pope Francis. Uh, I say that Pope Francis has declared that he would vote for Donald Trump. So I know what fake news are, but, but it's funny. I like my mm -hmm. job. Problem is that uh, the, the, the real thing is not the fake news, it's that people trust them. The point is that people are stupid. That is what Paul Horner says. Yes. I, 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 I say, no, it's not true that people are stupid. People know what they are doing. They hate those politicians and especially finan the, the, the financial class that has destroyed their life. Mm -hmm. That is the point. Hate. 
Uh, we, we are waging a campaign against hate and preaching people not to be so hateful and so on. You know what? Hate is, uh, is a malady. It's like cancer. Mm -hmm. Would you make a campaign persuading people that please don't have cancer? That the problem is that cancer comes because of material causes like hate. Late is massively produced by the social humiliation of people. So you cannot convince people not to wait. You have to, to heal this sickness. And the only way to heal it, I suggest, is equality. Mm -hmm. Is a, a, an egalitarian Equal. transformation of the social system, okay. if possible. Uh, you mentioned already, Ingrid mentioned the authoritarian regimes, Russia and even much more China, and maybe we should turn to China for a second now. Um, they are they're creating a surveillance uh, state which is probably worse than anything that we see in, in, the, in the West, uh, making it impossible to, to think, not only to say things differently, but even perhaps even to think things differently. Uh, is this done using Western technology for that? Um, is this something which is uh, maybe not only limited to China, but can then the kind of same technology, the same methods can be used by half authoritarian regimes, whether it's Russia, Turkey, maybe even in our neighborhood? Uh, are we here facing a new huge danger to freedom and the freedom of speech and in general freedom? We have underway a major system competition. Um, you know, will the Chinese model provide citizens with better peace and prosperity than our Western democratic system? Um, the, I think um, the social credits system in China where, you know, the, the story goes, I mean, there's cameras everywhere with facial recognition technology. Uh, and everything in China is now electronic, including your, your banking and, and, and just carrying cash. Uh, and so, the, you know, the standard story is, you know, the person's jaywalking, and by the time they get to the other side of the street, the fine has been imposed and taken out of their bank account, right? And it's, and there's some truth to it. And, I and don't it's think, possible. Yeah. It's no, I, 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 possible I, to do and it. And I, I don't think any of us want to live in a surveillance society. Uh, which is why you know, facial recognition technologies in particular have some very useful benefits, but we also have to recognize they have some really terrible possible uses. And so we need to regulate that. We can't count on companies to be ethical and, and that be enough because ethical companies will be, but other companies won't. So, you know, in the systems competition, um, I think that uh, we, we need to recognize that we do have very different social values in the Chinese system, um, that, we, that you know, technology can be used for good things and bad, and we need to think about you know, the Belt and Road uh, soft diplomacy of China uh, across Africa is very successful. What is North America and Europe doing to provide an alternative narrative? and an alternative uh, approach. Because I do think there's gonna, there's gonna be governments where if your number one goal in government is to remain in government, um, you're gonna have people choosing um, repressive means to deploy technology. Ingrid, may, yes. may I add something to it? It's, it's uh, just to, to t uh, make this clear, this really is already happening, um, what John Frank just told us. Bloomberg documented that there was a foreigner living in China and he really jaywalked, so it was, the traffic light was red and he walked uh, to the other side of the street and um, there was a camera there and he didn't mind, so, um, but you have to know in China many people use WeChat to pay in restaurants, to pay in shops, so it's like the normal currency there. And he also had a WeChat um, account with money on it and he was uh, jaywalking. And the one thing is, um, at many um, traffic um, intersections, you would have then also monitors there with a wall of shame, where you see the faces of people who just jaywalked. So it's public um, humiliation. 
Um, and the other thing is, so he just was jaywalking and he wouldn't have mind, but later he looks at his phone and he saw that the government really he built him already. He already transferred, they already took the amount of the bill he had to pay out of his um, yeah. account. And you see two things with this example. You see that the government can access your financial, your, your, your account, your financial account. Just think about that in Austria, if the government could just take money from your financial account, how would we feel about that? And the other interesting thing is he's a foreigner. So they have this artificial intelligence, facial recognition, also with foreigners. And there's this question whether the Chinese state um, can do a lot more things that they don't talk about. For example, there was also a foreigner at an airport and he just went to a screen to see to which gate he wants to go to fly, to take the next flight, and the screen showed him the next gate. And he was very surprised because he did, had not signed up for any such system. So you should be um, thinking about that, chi you should be aware that China probably has quite some cap capabilities in this field. And which leads me to, I think, the bigger question here. You said, can this happen somewhere else? I think yes, because we see already corporations within, um, with governments or governmental organizations and big tech for a lot of recognition systems, but I think the bigger question is what type of society and what type of internet do we want? And at the moment we have basically two types of internet. We have um, the American way, um, we have Facebook, Microsoft, we have big tech companies coming from the United States who often um, are built also I would say around um, um, American democratic ideals and American values. For example, Facebook forbids um, showing nipples but it's, it's, for a long time, they were not as um, strict regarding um, showing hate speech. They've become more strict. So um, we have an American internet, which is built around American values, and we have, have now also an, a Chinese internet, which is built around totally different values. Just one aspect, in China, there's a word for privacy, and you, if you would literally translate it into English, it would mean dirty secrets. So they don't have the same idea about um, privacy, privatsphere, as we would have. So I think the big answer we need to have is we don't need just an American version of the Internet and the Chinese version of the Internet. We really need to ask ourselves what could be a European version yeah. of the Internet. And I think this is the big question for the next 20, 30 years. Is there, is, in Brussels and you are the area where you're working, is there, are there pla thoughts about what a European Internet should look, look, look like or actual steps towards getting there? there? There's a lot of discussion today, and the, the common phrase is digital sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, it means a lot of things to different people, but there is a sense that European societies, countries, political debates are losing agency because, if you will, technology has, quote, democratized everything, and so, but in a country where you no longer know what's going on, um, there is a loss of agency. And so while we believe we have borders, uh, but if we don't have agency within our borders, um, you know, I think gov not just governance or governance, but citizens should be concerned. And so there, you know, where this discussion goes is, is somewhat open form, but there is a growing sense that this loss of agency uh, is, is essential to address. And so having rules about, you know, when we look at how the online ecosystem works, um, I personally think, you know, the, the advertising business model, uh, which drives many benefits, also causes some problems. Mm -hmm. And we can look at privacy regulation, but I don't think privacy regulation by itself is sufficient to address the many issues of online advertising. And so I, I personally think that is a good place to start and say we need to understand this market and the information that's being shared about me when I do a search or go to a website. Um, I'm not signing up, I think, for essentially commercial surveillance, um, which is all too ubiquitous. Franco, I mean, there are in Europe, there are groups, there are people who are fighting this kind of uh, new internet uh, dictatorship or so, uh, do they have any chance to change, to change the rules? I've, I've marked an expression of John that I thank for the losing agency. 
Uh, it's another way of, of saying impotence. Of saying <laughs> impotence you know. um, I read the texts of my friend Eugeni Morozov that I esteem very much. I think he is the best when it comes to analyzing the processes and so on. Then I see his proposals. Hmm? that are the proposals of the well-meaning, well-intentioned mm -hmm. people of the left, and not only of the left. Uh, 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 the proposal is regulation, regulation, yeah. regulation. I, I think, uh, of course, I, I, I'm glad, I, I know those are the best people, but uh, the problem is not regulation, the problem is healing. Mm -hmm. It's really a problem of disentangling something in the soul of people, in the mind of people, in the social aptitude of people. Um, so, of course, it would be a good thing if the European Union is able to cash some money from Apple and Facebook and Google and Microsoft. Um, should be a very <laughs> good yes. thing and I support that, but it's, it's not there, the solution. I mean, do you think that, uh, that that's a question I, I, I ask every time, do you think that Google belongs to the United States of America? No, I think that the United States of America belongs to Google. Okay. So the real problem is there. But they also belong to Facebook, don't they? Or, yeah, <laughs> of course. Especially to Google. For many Especially reasons, to Google, Google is okay. more important, okay. more crucial. So I say, the real power now yeah. is in the hands of the cognitive workers of Google, of Microsoft, of, I mean, workers. Those who are producing the machine, who have produced and, and go on producing the machine, it's them, it's their consciousness, it's their political agency that I call. Come on like the engineer who refused in Google, signed the letter saying, if Google make a contract with the Pentagon for putting artificial intelligence inside the, the uh, military drone, the killing drone, I resign. 4,000 people, 4,000 employees in Google signed the letter and Google has been obliged to go back to retreat. I know someone else will make the artificial intelligence for killing people. Um, I know. But that is a beginning. Now, because you, you always say politics is impotent. Now, uh, you, have also, you have also an electoral process in the United States, and it's interesting, yeah. for example, I think Mark Zuckerberg was known to be, he is afraid of Elizabeth Warren who is the yeah, most ardent one to on, on regulating also major corporations. Uh, now, with just as a hypothetical scenario, would uh, Warren, Elizabeth Warren as president, would she change something, or would I still the United so. States belong to I Google? I think that if 10,000 uh, workers of Google and Microsoft organize a, 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 a strike, a political a demonstration, political action uh, for a change of the machine that is much more important of the president of the United States. The president of the United States is a criminal by nature. You mean so I don't who, who, see Elizabeth Warren as the president. Oh, okay. So, so it means good. Um, John, do you is 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 uh, <laughs> does not not the question of the criminal by nature? You don't have to have comment on that. But does does Google own the United States? Look, I, or perhaps I'll, I'll Microsoft up. too. I'm, <laughs> I'm one of those neoliberal leftists that uh, uh, yes. are the source of the, of the issues. Uh, look, I, the. Uh, I think that coming from my perspective, you know, I, I do have a very different, you know, point of departure. But I do agree that we need to look at how these technologies actually operate in our society. And there's an aspect of, 
you know, contradiction. You know, social media can bring us together, but it also at the same time can isolate us individually and, and divide us even more. And so last week I was in a restaurant in Brussels and walked in, there were, there were four young men uh, at the dinner table next to us, each on their phone, not interacting with each other. And I'm sure you've seen something similar, but it's sort of, you know, it is the isolating power of, of this technology that, that does have an impact on us just as people, Oops. right? And I think that we need to recognize that and we need to have a discussion about, you know, how do we adapt? I mean, people can't adapt as fast as technology progresses. We're always gonna be somewhat behind and it's part of human nature. We, we aspire to make things better uh, and we experiment. Some things work out well, some things not so well, uh, but you know, there is going to be a need to deal with what is social life, what are societal values at a time when we have all this connectivity that can also isolate us and divide us. May I add yes. something? Um, I think that was a bit unfair towards um, Elizabeth Warren, to, I must say, because um, at the moment, when you look at um, the Democratic Party, they have so far two very progressive candidates compared to the like typical democratic candidate it's uh, you see a shift in american politics and the shift which is i would say uh, really closely aligned with your arguments that it's about the economy stupid but in a as you you your, when you speak it's very clear that you come from a marxist tradition it's the, 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 the grounding of all of your arguments but i would say that um those progressive candidates, they are very um, closely aligned with um, at the ideal of the American thought of um, all power should be in checks. By which I mean the following. The United States once had a big, big um, uh, tradition of being really strict regarding big companies. It started with, with Standard Oil at the beginning of the 20th century. This was um, Rockefeller's oil company, um, which used unfair tactics to grow and grow, and then basically own of the oil, own the whole oil industry and trains and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the president then was Roosevelt, and he said. It's a problem when companies Theodore Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt yes. exactly. It's a problem when companies get too big and they seem to be more important than politics. At the end in the United States it's our elected politicians who make the rules, not companies and not uh, monopolies. And starting from this point, they have um, made um, very strict rules regarding monopolies, which then in the 80s uh, more and more were regarded um, outdated and suddenly you would have really huge companies going bigger and bigger. And what Elizabeth Warren says is we are again in such a situation where the influence of Facebook is too big on our society and too big on politics and she says um, Facebook has to be broken up. And she, as the president, would have actually a lot of power in this regard. You can all argue about the democratic system of the United States and how well or not well it works. But I think that looking from a purely regulative point, if Elizabeth Warren or perhaps Bernie Sanders would become president of the United States, I think this would be much more dangerous for Facebook and Google than Brussels at the current position. So I think that if you want a really strict um, political course regarding that, um, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are quite interesting candidates there. But you're saying they cannot become president, right? Yeah. Yes, of yes. course I agree. No, I just wanted to. Yes. Of course, especially because if Warren or Sanders wins the election, that means that in the United States there are many, many people ready to start again a movement like Occupy. That is the important thing. The movement, what happens in the streets, in the factories, in the schools, that is important. The president of the United States has no power. That is the point. I mean, the huge well. power 
of the President of the United States. It's nothing if it is not uh, the expression of a social movement, of a social and cultural transformation. This is what I am waiting for. And of course, I hope that Warren wins the elections. Um, <laughs> Yes, I would just <laughs> like to ask you now about this point about the different approach of the United States and Europe toward regulating large, large companies. Is there such a big, also kind of philosophical gap, the well, way they do it? I mean, I think there's, there's some philosophical points of departure. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Europe is more accustomed to regulation. The United States starts with more free enterprise, entrepreneurial uh, approach. Um, and there's also just a difference in politics. In Washington, D.C., um, it's pretty easy to get a bill introduced. Um, and lots of legislation gets introduced. There's lots of hearings, lots of reports, studies, think tanks, conferences. But if you look at the output, it's pretty small because it's very hard to get consensus um, on, on big, tough issues. And so we do not have a general privacy law in the United States, even though we called for one 12 years ago. And we've been trying to push it. But getting consensus is really hard. In Europe, uh, in Brussels in particular, the, you know, the political process starts, and the Europe Commis European Commission comes out with a proposal, um, and then it goes to the member state council and the parliament, uh, and it's almost impossible to stop. So almost everything comes out the other end, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, but so it, it, regulation does happen. Uh, and because uh, you don't have the, you know, Brussels is, it's political, but with a small p. In the United States, D.C. is more political with a big P and partisan, and, and so you get a, it's a more divided approach. Um, so um, there, there is more just capacity, I think, to get to decisions on regulation in Brussels than in Washington, D.C. I would like to ask you, because you are here from Microsoft, I mean, 20 years ago, it was Microsoft was the Google of, of, of the time, and Bill Gates was the, was the Mark Zuckerberg, and there was a lot of talk about this total dominance. Today, it's not anymore. What has changed? Well, I think, you know, and, and, um, I've had the pleasure and displeasure of living through each of those episodes. Uh, and the antitrust case in the United States, it did seem to be this, from our point of view, this strong political statement that you're too powerful. And we were saying, look, is really putting a browser on a new computer that's being sold, is that really such an antitrust violation? Um, and it took us a while to understand that the technical issues we might be right about, but the broader issues we needed to learn and listen. And so we were the first to go through the process of having the antitrust scrutiny. So we were the, we're the first to go through it. We say we're first in our class, but it's not that, that we did it best, but just we went through it earlier. And it did have a profound influence on, on the people involved in our company. And you know, I, I'm really proud of, I think, very enlightened, thoughtful leadership of our company. Um, you know, we are committed to understanding and, and trying to under, you know, appreciate the incredibly significant role that technology can play in society. Um, but younger companies having, you know, I was there before when, when Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer were, were enduring these things, your natural reaction is, if they only understood, I'm trying to do good. And, and it takes a while, and I think you know, some of the other companies the leadership is, is still learning those lessons. Um, and we'll see if they get there. Ingrid, you know the technology world quite well. Is Microsoft getting a bit of a, a, like a blank check right now? And yes, I mean, I think that, for example, also in this debate, it always happens. We always talk about Facebook because um, um, Facebook is the elephant in the room. And I think that they are often rather good in getting people outraged with things that Mark Zuckerberg says. Mm -hmm. For example, when you look at Google and you look at, for example, the question, how do we deal with political ads? It's a really interesting question. You will have a lot of statements by Mark Zuckerberg, which we, people get really angry about. And then just remember, what did Google say? 
I don't remember because they don't talk about it that much, which is a very clever PR strategy by Google that they don't try to talk about th those enraging topics. But they did change their policies. They did change the policies. But of course, when you, look at, um, when you look at the public debate, we talk a lot about Facebook. YouTube is also a big factor. We talk very little about mm -hmm. YouTube or um, Google's um, role as the leading search engine. We should talk about that too. And Microsoft, it's perhaps I guess Microsoft would have liked to own one of the leading social networks, but that did not work out. So I guess your, 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 the tragedy from econo an economic point of view is that you did not um, participate in that trend su really successfully, but it helps you that in that point you're not the p biggest target from a political point of view. That's, I would say it like that. Perhaps you want to disagree. Um, but I, I think coming back to the ant antitrust case, I think that um, it's, it's really interesting because when you look at the United States, uh, at, at Europe, and how strict um, the regulators were when it came to Microsoft, and I think correctly, uh, because um, you, w w how you um, implemented the um, Windows Media Player was quite um, a, a dominant move. But um, I think we need the same strictness now because um, we have the, the, this, this big, at, um, huge companies that evolved. We have them because um, European regulators did not do enough. That Facebook became so big is the result that they were allowed to buy Instagram and then also WhatsApp, WhatsApp for 22 million euros. And there was even, um, the, the EU commission looked at that and they allowed billion, it. Billion, okay. billion, billion, yeah. sorry, billion. Yeah. Uh, they, they allowed it. And the problem is today, this is considered as a mistake by many, mm -hmm. and even the economist writes that today the European Commission would not allow this. And so we often have this idea that companies have become so great and so dominant because they were so intelligent and in, in innovative, but it's not being innovative when you just buy the newer rival, which, which has happened. So I think that we should mm -hmm. have the same strictness regarding those social media platforms and um, Google as well, as we already had with Microsoft. And when you look at at Brussels, I think that Margrethe Vestager actually is one of the more stricter commissioners and she's really into this topic. Um, may I just one, mm -hmm. one last thought? I think that we will have a lot of regulation in the next years coming from the EU. There are some proposals already, you can find them online. But I think it's not the question if we will have regulation. The question is what kind of regulation and if it's a regulation that is good for the citizens. Because at the European level you of course have a lot of lobbying. And of course, that at the end, there's the question, is it more the, the needs of the citizens which will be reflected in that regulation, or is it more the ideas of bigger tech companies? Because all big tech companies, when you look, sit at panels with them, they say regulation is necessary. But of course, I think they perhaps sometimes think of different kinds of regulation than you perhaps in the audience would. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um. Well, you, you said before it's Google that is really the, 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 the biggest problem. Uh, can you just explain why? Well, mm, let's say that Google is uh, the map of contemporary capitalism, the self-referring, the indexical map of the contemporary capitalism. Um, Facebook is uh, working more on the level of the of the discourse, of the self-perception, mm -hmm. so it's very important. Uh, Google is working on the infrastructure it itself. But you know, of course in the digital field, like everywhere, there are the good guys and the bad guys. And certainly Bill Gates is the good guy in the room. But I remember 1995. I am an old person and <laughs> I have a long memory. And I remember what Explorer has been for all of us, all the, the people like me <coughs> were enthusiastic about the, the internet revolution mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we have been obliged to understand that profit is the rule of the digital production. Okay. Profit, not knowledge, and not uh, the, the good uh, things, uh, profit. And uh, then many things changed also in the consciousness 
of people and of Bill Gates, I suppose. But the beginning of the dictatorship of profit in the digital world is explorer. Is Oh, the Internet Explorer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the browser. Back to you. <laughs> well, <coughs> if I may. Yes. Uh, Internet Explorer was, I, I, I joined in Microsoft in 1994 in Paris. And so Again. the launch of Windows 95 was one of those wonderful, fun experiences. Uh, and the launch of Internet Explorer um, came actually because we've been planning uh, an online service called the Microsoft Network and this thing called the World Wide Web came along, and uh, suddenly uh, the idea of a walled garden uh, didn't seem all that viable. Um, but the, um, you know, technology has evolved very, very fast. And in some ways, look, there's, I don't think anybody here would want to live without the World Wide Web um, and, you know, the kind of the many benefits we get from it. But, you know, I, I take the point that um, private companies, we're in business. And our incentives are different than governance of society. Um, I w well, uh, we do have a, uh, a professional network called LinkedIn, uh, which the is... The most boring professional network, uh, social network <laughs> days. <but laughs> profitable. Yes. Connecting people and, and valued by its members and participants, um, but you know it's you know we've chosen to have it not be a source where political discussions take place. Uh, it's a place for you know professional connections and sharing professional um, information and ideas. Um, so um, there there is a, there is concern about acquisitions today uh, in the tech sector and how acquisitions should be looked at. Um, you know, going back in our 10 or 12 years ago, um, trying, when we were trying to get out from underneath the, the process of having yet another competition case brought against us, um, we formed a little team um, that was focused on analyzing competition cases of our industry competitors. Uh, and, and so I spent a few years of my life uh, trying to persuade the European Commission to bring a competition case against Google and to block some of those mergers. Um, and we've since, uh, you know, made peace with Google and, and we've decided that, you know, if we have a competition concern, we'll talk to each other first. We can still talk to the regulator, but we're going to try to at least understand and have a dialogue. Um, the, but but they're, they're real, there are very real issues about how competition law should be used to shape uh, the industry. I, and I've, I sat in a conference uh, this fall where the, the, the heated debate between what, you know, is privacy law or competition law the tool to regulate industry? And my answer was both are relevant, but neither sufficient. Mm -hmm. Even combined, they're not sufficient. We need to think about, you know, what rules we want. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that you need to, um, you know, be open to other forms of regulation. Um, I would like, to, would hope, I can, maybe I can succeed in ending this discussion on a slightly more optimistic note. So I will <laughs> ask as a, fine, as a question uh, to all of you, are there any ways the internet can actually enrich democratic life, uh, support the kind of grassroots activism movement that you want? Can we actually foresee that there will be a, a, a positive digital democracy anytime soon? But <clears throat> as you can imagine, our job, my job, is, is not being optimistic or pessimistic. No, but, my but job, being an act, but also but thinking of being a Marxist, yeah, you, are, you, are, you have to be, let, you let, have let, to think of a better, let me better say future. What is my job, yes. <laughs> my job yes. is, is reading, trying to understand, yes. to understand the trends. Yes. So my understanding is, why, why do you expect that the internet should improve democratic life? I would be happy if the internet improve life. Okay. Full point. Yes, the internet has already improved our, our lives. My life has been decidedly improved by the existence of the internet. 
I have been part of that revolution, and this is something saying that for the first time in the human history, it has been possible to take part in a revolution without uh, being uh, uh, power. But the problem is not there. The problem is not the internet or not the internet. The problem is capitalism or not capitalism, as long as capitalism is the... the, the Okay, can you fight capitalism through the, with the internet? It has been possible for a long period of time. I remember Seattle, yes. 1999. The internet has been the main actor yes. of that. Uh, now it's... Uh, now I think that it's more impossible, the more important the psychoanalyst okay. than the tech person. But yes, yes, the internet is here to improve our lives, and we have to improve the internet. Okay. Uh, but the only way is to destroy capitalism. And it's a difficult <laughs> job. Yes, that is a difficult job. I can we can probably agree. Ingrid, what do you see? What kind of examples or signs do you see of, 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 of an enrichment of democratic life um, through technology? I think it's absolutely possible that we use digital tools in a way that enrich um, democracy or just our everyday life. Um, but I think we are at the crossroads where we have to decide in which direction mm -hmm. we'll go. And for example, I've mentioned that in, in Brussels on the European level, there is, uh, there is the beginning of new regulation. And for example, there was a high-level expert group on, fa uh, on artificial intelligence, and they um, published two reports. And at the first, after the first report, which stayed really vague and did not really help um, um, to find to, 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 to be the basic structure of real regulation, there was a lot of criticism. There was one member of the high-level expert group, um, Professor Thomas Metzinger from Germany, and he said that he tried to make some red, red lines that you cannot cross, like things that should be forbidden. And he, he, he wrote in an essay that he was told that he should not do that, that it's better to stay more vague. And he said that the industry interests were too clear in this group that they could not publish a stricter paper. This really led to a big outcry. And then in the second paper, it's been better. So and, the out, and the outcry was online probably too, wasn't yes, it? it was yes, it was also in, in traditional media. It <laughs> yes. was, for example, the Tages, Tagesspiegel in Germany that published that and okay. also published in English. And it was a big debate within this community. And the second paper was much better. Mm -hmm. There were clearer red lines which you should not cross, which you can build upon mm -hmm. in regulation. And to me, this is a good example. In Brussels, you have this kind of fight of different um, lobbies, and one of the lobbies are we as a citizens, and I think it's not clear yet which lobby will have the final word. And I think it's okay to have all the lobbies in there, but the end, the question is which lobby will be the driving force. So I'm, I, I'm optimistic, but it can be different. And just to the last thing I want to say, I said that we need to talk about a European internet. And I think it's absolutely possible for us to do that. Because the first stepping stone we have already made, um, we have already moved into that direction with the GDPR, with data um, protection. I think that is quite a good start. We also need additional regulation regarding new fields like artificial intelligence and um, political manipulations. These are fields we can regulate. This could be the second pillar. And I think the third pillar, it needs to be um, fighting inequality. Because digital tools also have the possibility to enhance inequality. When you look at, for example, um, Uber, or when you look at Amazon, you see that often the, the new jobs that are being created are often not very good jobs. So we also need to have, think about these new um, economic structures we are building. Are people getting richer or are people getting poorer? And so if you think about what could be a European internet, it should be one that, um, that protects data of citizens, that also protects us from manipulation and really two unfair methods. And thirdly, it should be an internet where people can live off their jobs. And if we manage to focus on these three fields, I think the internet will be a force for good. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you.
ask you on as a, as a, maybe as a, as a, as a final comment. Also, you've been also dealing with the question of, the, of electronic voting, of then they, right. you, have, you, have, you have online surveys, you have organization. I mean, civil society can also use the internet. Is there, what, is, uh, what, what, is the role of, what is the role of that? Well, uh, first of all, I don't think we have to defeat Marxism or capitalism to be able to move forward and embrace our world today. And technology is here. It shapes our society, and society should have a role in shaping it. And, and I think that, you know, I very much agree that European values should be shaping our, our, our society. And if technology is going to be part of that society, and it is going to be, we need to engage with it. Um, now, some of the early experiments, we thought that this would bring us, um, you know, the, the, whether it was Seattle 1999 or the Arab Spring examples, there was this bright hope that this was going to, you know, technology, internet connectivity would bring us all together and enable us to do all sorts of things, and yet we find today the, the social capital, uh, the social uh, credit system uh, in China mm -hmm. being the other extreme, things that for the Chinese model, it may be fine, but for others, clearly not the society we want to live in. Um, you know, there, there has been some good experimentation with how do we use these tools for democratic means. And so, um, ironically, Taiwan is probably one of the leading places where they're, they're looking at how do we create new social tools, not commercial ones, but that can promote democracy. Um, concepts of about voting rules and a concept called quadratic voting, which you know, is intended to, to give people um, an ability to express preferences in ways that are uh, both democratic and yet measure intensity. Uh, and so uh, a simple example would be a legislature trying to allocate budget. Um, you'd give each legislator 100 votes, and they can put, you know, they can put votes across a variety of things, but the more votes they get, the more votes they spend. So if you, if you want to send, you know, if I want to put one vote on, you know, on clean water, um, okay, that's fine. But if I want to put two votes, it costs me four votes. If I want to put three votes there, it costs me nine votes. Mm -hmm. um, and you can put all 10 to spend a hundred, your 100 if you really care about clean water. And so these experiments in, in sort of how do we change some of these rules and apply that online um, are worth experimenting with. We shouldn't assume they're all going to work. We should, in fact, we should assume that go into the experiment. And we say we have a thing we call, if you're going to fail, fail fast, right? Learn from it and improve. So, but, but we do need to engage as a society in recognizing we are going to live in a connected world. Um, and we're going to live in a world um, that is uh, increasingly connected. But it's not just governance, it's our private decisions. And so I'll make a pitch for supporting journalism. You know, we need professional journalism if our democratic society is going to survive. We need to support it, we need to buy subscriptions. Um, we need to um, you know, participate because the democratic process relies on people and you know, I think that we're going to go through profound changes as a society, and the democratic process is the most valuable thing we've got. So um, encourage participation, engagement, listening to others, and, and taking control of how society will be shaped by the inevitable march of technology. Well, that's a positive note to, stand, to end this discussion and to finish this debate. I would like to thank you very, very much, John, Ingrid, and Franco, and the audience, all of you, for your interest, and all the organizers, and I wish you a very nice Sunday for the rest of the day.